Dr. Clark, Dr. Mangrum, to Dr. Wright, and all of the faculty members and students and friends from all over the country, Dr. Scott and Dr. Price and Dr. Jemison, all of you who have been my friends through the years. I very much appreciate the opportunity of, of being here tonight. And I think that I'm less worthy than many people uh, to preach on this TM Chambers night. I see Mrs. Chambers out there. Stand up, Mrs. Chambers. Some people may not know you. She's, she's here. Uh, Dr. Chambers used to preach for me, and I used to preach for him. And I always felt when I heard him preach that the Lord had shortchanged me. <laughs> he was very resourceful and he never put on the brakes when he preached. Now if you didn't get with him, he'd run over you. I know when I was attending Howard University in 38, Dr. the late Dr. William H. Jernigan, pastor of Mount Carmel Baptist Church, where I belonged while I was in Washington, had Dr. Chambers to conduct a revival. I had never heard him and some of the students said that if you didn't get to the church by 6.30, there was no need of going. Well, I didn't see any need of rushing to hear somebody 6.30 when the service wasn't going to start until 8. And I took my time. And when I got there, about a quarter to eight, I couldn't get in my own church. His massive spirit and his eminently trained mind uh, made him unusual. And back there, you didn't have too many uh, Baptist preachers at least who had finished college and he was in a small class of preachers who had finished Bishop College he and MC Williams um, really put Bishop on the map wherever they went. In fact, uh, uh, Dr. Williams feels that anybody who hasn't finished Bishop uh, doesn't have his head screwed on tight enough. <laughs> and I told him one day that his head is screwed on too tight. Bishop has made a tremendous contribution to the world and it does not yet appear what it shall do. I'm inspired to have many of my fellow ministers from Chicago and from 
Louisville, Kentucky, and I've seen two or three from New York City where I passed it. I couldn't think of a word that would say just what I wanted to say in my subject tonight, uh, but being on a college campus, I think I can use it. I wouldn't use this in a church because uh, people might misunderstand and accuse me of trying to be deep. My subject tonight is the divine principle of reciprocation. The divine principle of reciprocation. I couldn't find a word to say uh, just what I wanted uh, it to say, so I, I had to use this. You know what reciprocation is. Um, it is back scratching. Yeah. You scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. Oh, better still, we all acquainted with uh, this uh, social etiquette. Uh, if I fix a big dinner for you this Christmas, I don't expect to be invited next Christmas until you reciprocate. The women will appreciate this. When I pastored in Louisville, Kentucky, the minister's wives had a secret pal party. And your secret pal, the secret pal, uh, would carry a gift uh, to a person that she didn't know uh, who it was going to be. And my wife uh, had a secret pal, and at that time, White Shoulders Cologne was very popular, and she bought a bottle of White Shoulders Cologne. And at that time, it was kind of expensive. And when they called the name of the secret pal. My wife took this bottle of cologne, beautifully wrapped, and, and presented it. And then her name was called, and she uh, got this small package, beautifully wrapped. And um, on our way home, she opened it. And this woman had given her a bar of cashmere soap. I'm in this sanctuary and I can't tell you what my wife said. Mm -hmm. But she never went to another party after that. The, the divine principle of reciprocation. Uh, now this, this is kind of becoming to us. I, I can understand that. I can understand uh, our reciprocating and our drawback when we are not favored. 
Uh, but I was a little set back um, when I found that uh, this reciprocation is based upon a divine principle. I'm, I'm a little set back because I don't want God to be like us. You see, I don't, I don't ever want to get tired of God, and I do get tired of us. <laughs> For a long time, man could not uh, put up with God. He just he just couldn't put up with God and he he got to the place where he he didn't do anything that God wanted him to do uh, except a few people like Abraham um, and Abraham was a little fed up with with God Job was a little fed up with him um, Jeremiah uh, was a little fed up, but but it was a passing something. It was a passing something. Uh, Job confronted God to his face one day, and he said, uh, "You are too hard on people. You're too hard on people." He said, you're mad with the whole human race because Adam and Eve sinned. He said, man, you ought to go somewhere until your wrath is past. He said, this, this is not right. This is not right. This is not right. Uh, you, you, even if a tree is cut out, it, its tender branches will come forth and it'll live again. But where is man? Yea, man giveth up the ghost and is no more. And so answer this question. If a man dies, shall he live again? And you know about Moses. Moses um, confronted God and made God rescind an action that he had said he would do by consuming the Hebrews. They had uh, forsaken God and had set up an idol and God told Moses, well, God disclaimed the people and came down and said, Moses, uh, thy people, Moses said, uh, don't put them on me. He said, you gave them to me. <laughs> they are thy people. <laughs> so I'm going to consume them. I, we get, can you, can you imagine God saying that? I'm going to consume all of them. Moses said, well, you can't do that. He said, you can't do that. He said, um, what will the Egyptians think about you getting these people out in the wilderness and destroying them? And what will the seed of Abraham Think if there will be in his seed, you promised him that his seed would would be as the sand. What will they say when they come along? Um, God said, "Well, I'm going to consume them." Moses said, "Well, if you do that, you just blot my name out of your book." Right now. Yeah, yeah. 
for I'm standing as hostage for these people. And I can't put up with a God like that. No. Now you read this. We read it. I don't understand it. I've never preached on it. You read it. But the Bible says God repented that he had even thought to do evil against his people. That's in the Bible. That's a, you all got quiet, but that's in the Bible. And God came in all sorts of ways trying to get up to man. And he never could get close to man because man decided that God was infinite and had no way of understanding him. And man was finite and could never measure up to God. What are, you, what are you all waiting on? I'm preaching now. Right. And so God said, I'll have to fix this. I'll have to fix this. I'll have to fix this. I'm breaking up all of the cedars of Lebanon and then complaining that I didn't have enough kindling wood. When I speak, I have a voice as many waters. And I'll have to fix this so that man will come close enough to me to understand and so I'll have to uh, represent myself in flesh and that's the only reason he sent Jesus Christ And we can follow him, we can yes. follow him, see, because at all points he was tempted as we are tempted. Uh, but I, I got along, I got along with this, I got along with this until um, uh, I was preparing this message not long ago. And I don't see where Jesus is too much unlike God. For he says in the text in Mark, the 8th chapter, and the uh, 38th verse. Now, you have your Bibles. I didn't print this Bible. Mark the 8th chapter and the 8th verse, and um, 38th verse. And this is so much like us because when, when I grew up in the country, people used to pray, Lord, if you save my soul, if I will reciprocate, I'll, I'll serve you. If you help me to send my son to college, I'll do more for you. But I didn't expect Jesus to say this. Uh, and Shaw, you didn't either. You, you don't know what I'm going to say, but you didn't expect Jesus to say this. But in closing that eighth chapter, Mark has Jesus saying in, in red letters. 
Mark didn't want you, and you see, the New Testament scholars say that Mark's gospel is more authentic than the others, that these others copied from Mark. And so Mark didn't want you to think that he said what Jesus said. He has Jesus saying it himself. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed. when he cometh in the glory of his Father Amen. with the holy angels. Amen. The divine principle of reciprocation. If you are ashamed of me, said Jesus, I'm not sending you word, I am telling you. Whosoever shall be ashamed of me, I will be ashamed of him. And Jesus was dead serious. And I have watched this. I have watched this. There are three areas of our personality, I think, that Jesus was addressing uh, himself to. And the first area is the emotion. He could have said, whosoever is ashamed to express his emotions for me. I will be ashamed of him. That's one thing that Tim Chambers was never guilty of. a graduate of Bishop College way back there. Mm. But he was never ashamed to express his emotion. He expressed them so that it went to his bones. He said, bless my bones. Right. The disciples had reason to be ashamed of Jesus, and his followers had reason to be ashamed of Jesus. He was just the opposite of everything that they knew. His teaching was just the opposite of all the teachings that they knew about. In fact, you know, his teaching is just now making sense. My God. Oh, yeah. Just now making sense. He was talking about forgiveness, and Peter wasn't thinking about what he was saying because he knew the law. And the law was exact. It said, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Forgive nothing. If anybody pluck you out, pluck his out. <laughs> and so one day, Peter confronted Jesus in front of the other apostles and said, How many times must I forgive my brother? Seven times? 
And Jesus said, oh, Peter, you must understand the seriousness of forgiveness. Not seven times, but 70 times seven. Well, Peter wasn't a good mathematician. He had to sit up all night to figure that that came to 492 times. And he got up the next morning. And the Bible said from then on, he followed Jesus afar off. He must have been ashamed. He must have been ashamed. And I know he was ashamed in the garden that night. He, Peter was ashamed. Peter was ashamed. Jesus had told them to put up the sword. Well, Peter wasn't thinking about that. He sneaked that sword under his tunic. And went to the garden with Jesus. And Jesus was arrested, and Peter cut off the air of the high priest. Now, Peter wasn't after that air. He was after his head. <laughs> and instead of Jesus congratulating Peter, he stooped down and picked up that air. He stuck it back on that high priest's head and it was healed instantly and Peter was standing there waiting for congratulations and when he saw Jesus heal that put that air back and healed it, he said, Well I be blessed. dishonest with our own feelings. We feel like shouting. We feel like preaching. We feel like raising our voice. We feel just like Dr. Clark feels. We just won't do it. See, Dr. Clark doesn't care. There's, I have some friends here, Dr. Lawson and others. There's, no, there's an Episcopal church in Memphis, Tennessee. And you know how, you know how well they've gotten along all these years. They don't have but one. One, one Episcopal church. Black, one Episcopal church, black. This is true. That's my home, I know. And I was there at this time. Now, I can get along with white Episcopalians uh, because I don't think they know any better. <laughs> but when, when black people become Episcopalians, they stop breathing. They sit up in church like a bunch of mummies. Nobody breathing. And so there was a woman, I know she's dead now, Sister Amelia Fant was one of these born again Baptists, and, and she was stopped.
went there. She'd never been there before. And of course, she thought, you know, it was the church, and, and they didn't mind praising Jesus. <laughs> and the priest was reading his uh, hoary ceremony, and he came across the word Jesus. Sister Fan said, Amen, call his name. That's what I came here to hear. The priest stopped him, but he didn't move his hand. He didn't want to lose the place where he was. <laughs> and he said, as I was saying, Jesus Christ, she still said, Brother, I call his name. The priest beckoned for the usher, and the usher came all the way down to this family seat and took her by the arm and said, Come go with me. She said, I'm, For what? Say you're keeping too much noise. She said, I can't help it. I got religion. He said, well, you didn't get it here, so come on, let's go. <laughs> if it's the church of Jesus Christ, hear me tonight. If it's the church of Jesus Christ, why shouldn't she have gotten it there? If it's the church of Jesus Christ, if it is his church, why couldn't she say praise the name of Jesus? Why, she, should, why couldn't she use the whole area of her emotion to praise Jesus? And I don't understand it. I really don't understand how people, even church people, can run all up and down the road and run all up and down the house when Elvis Presley's calling calling the nothing but a hound dog. <laughs> and can't run for Jesus who calls them sons of God. <laughs> Are we ashamed? to use our emotion. Are we, are we ashamed to use our emotion? Can we shout in the Sodom and Gomorrah Baptist Church and can't shout in car, Collins, chapel? Are we ashamed to shout in that ghetto community and can't come on this campus to shout? Are we ashamed? in the area of our emotion. Jesus said, well, if you are, I will be ashamed of you and never let Jesus be ashamed of you. The disciples must have been ashamed that day when Jesus, when Jesus was making his triumphant entry into Jerusalem, all of the kings and emperors had come riding great white horses. Here come this carpenter from Nazareth riding this little donkey with his feet dragging the ground. They said, who is this? But there was one man who was not ashamed. 
he pulled off his coat. He said, no, no, oh no, before you mount this donkey, you are too worthy to ride on the back of a horse. If you put his coat on the horse and then lifted Jesus on this donkey. And the man pulled off his coat and put it in the, in, the, in the way for the donkey to ride on. And others who didn't have coats, never had coats, said, my God, I have to have something. And they began to pull off branches. In the city of Jerusalem, in the city of Jerusalem, not in back Galilee, but in the city of Jerusalem, the heavens rang with voices of people who let their emotions run wild. Hosanna. Yes, sir. Hosanna. Those stiff Pharisees who had never used their emotions, even for God Almighty, said, rebuke these people, Jesus. That little boy who had given Jesus his lunch came yes, up sir. and said, what are you talking about, rebuke? You want me to be quiet? I will never be quiet. I saw that man. I gave that man my lunch of five barley loaves and two little fishes. And I saw him break them up. And I saw him reaching up into heaven, pulling down bread and pulling down fish. And you want me to hush? No, I will not hush. Hold on. And Dr. Hill, you ought to jump up tonight and join the He's done enough for you to say, hold on. He's done enough for us to let our emotions run wild and say, hold on. Hosanna. And I don't have to have, I don't have to go to Sodom and Gomorrah Baptist Church to say it. I'm saying it here. Hosanna. Hosanna. He put shoes on my feet. When I didn't have shoes. He put clothes on my back when I didn't have clothes. He sent me to school when I didn't have anybody to help me. Who's out of? But the mayor said you must be stupid. Well, I couldn't see, man. I couldn't see. No. Nobody could help me. The doctors couldn't help me. This man came by and called me to see. And you think I'm going to be quiet? Hold that up! <laughs> that woman who suffered an issue of blood for 12 years said, let me get through here. Let me, let me get through here. The so man, I wouldn't have lived a week after Jesus passed by my house. And I just touched the hem of his garment. That's all I did. I just touched the hem of his garment. And he healed me on the spot. Get out of my way. Hold that up. And Jesus said, if you are ashamed, the rocks won't be ashamed. Something has to praise me. And if you hold your peace, the rock will immediately cry out. And I have word for you. I have word for you tonight. No rock is going to take my place. Uh, the next area is the intellect. Are you ashamed to use your intellect for Jesus? 
I didn't want to preach. I didn't want to preach. I really didn't want to preach. Because I'd, I'd been to school and I was in the school. And all the, most of the preachers that I had heard had never been to school. And I didn't see any need of going to school and spending my time to preach. And I was going to teach. I had felt the call of God long before I admitted it. But I didn't want to preach for two reasons. The first reason was I had seen with my naked eye how preachers had suffered. Amen. The second reason, all the preachers who could get churches had to hoop. I didn't mind hooping, but I just don't have that kind of equipment. I think it's a wonderful expression. And nobody could use it better than T.M. Chambers. And so I refused to use my intellect to preach. And I'm telling you by personal experience, Jesus was ashamed of me. I began to dry up spiritually. Some of you who knew me, Jemison, and others who knew me, knew I could sing. God even took my voice of, of singing. He was ashamed of me. I was so frustrated that I went to a Ph.D. to tell him that I thought I was called to preach. That was Dr. Benjamin E. Mays, the dean of the School of Religion at Howard. I had a conference with him, and I thought he had sense enough to give me some relief. It was in the winter time. I went in the study, pulled off my overcoat, and he came around and hung my overcoat on the rack. And he said, what is it, Mr. King? I said, Dean Mays, I think I'm called to preach. He got up, went to the rack, and got my coat. Christ was not only ashamed of me, Benjamin Mays was ashamed of me. <laughs> Handed me my coat, didn't even put, didn't even hold it for me to put on. Handed me my coat, went to the door and opened it and said, all I have to say is if you can keep from preaching, don't preach. What he was saying in word, if you are ashamed right. yes, to confess that you feel a call to the ministry, don't preach. Yes. I made up my mind that day yes, that I was going to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Am I preaching? Yes, yes, sir. Oh, 
Are you ashamed to express your intellect for Jesus Christ? I was in Memphis, Tennessee, May of last year. I was there for my class reunion at Lemoyne College, Lemoyne Owen College now. And that gymnasium was full of academic snobs. <laughs> I was in the bunch. Yeah. I was seated way back, but there was a woman, I didn't know her. Dr. Dinkins gave me her name later. She was about four or five seat, seats from the platform. Mm -hmm. The woman had had a hard time. She had seen her daughter, Juanita, go through four years. And she was ready to receive her degree that day. Nobody knew she was there, and I know she didn't mean to do this. When the dean presented the graduates, the president was there to confer the degrees. He said, Mr. President, these graduates qualify for the degrees, the A.B. and the B.S. degrees. And he began to call the names of the people, went around to the end and came up on the platform. And finally he called Juanita Farling's name. When she started around, as she went up on the platform, this woman said, nope, nobody but you, Jesus. <laughs> that was at a college commencement exercise. This woman had picked up her uh, uh, emotions for four years. And only Jesus helped her to come to that graduation to see her daughter graduate. She said, nobody but you, Jesus. And the people started looking around. She said, I mean, nobody but Jesus. And I got up, I got up. I, I couldn't help it. I couldn't, I couldn't help it. I couldn't help it. I threw my intellect on the floor. And came way down the aisle. And I caught a hold of that woman's hand. I said, if you want to shout here, shout! Shout, shout! They had to hold her at the commencement. And what was so beautiful, all of those young people applauded their proof. And what was so beautiful again, I saw President Walker taking his handkerchief out. And then he said to that congregation, if you knew the struggle of this woman to get her daughter through school, you would say, nobody but you, Jesus. Well, 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 listen, listen, would you do this in this, in this uh, academic atmosphere and in this chapel? Take somebody by the hand and say out loud, nobody but Jesus. You ought to be able to say it. You ought to be able to say it. Even here tonight, you ought to be able to say it. Nobody but you. I see some people here right now. I see some preachers here right now who couldn't preach a lick when I first heard them. And now they're preaching. Nobody but Jesus. Nobody, nobody but Jesus. Not the seminary. Nobody but Jesus. Mm. 
in the area of the intellect. Don't be ashamed of Jesus. Dr. Mangrum, I don't have to hurry, do I? This is the final area, the area of the will. That's where we are, that's where we are. That's where we are. I had pastored in Paducah for four years. That was my first church, Washington Street. Baptist Church. I pastored there for four years. And that's the kind of an elite church. A very stiff, dignified church. And they really were not particular about what I was saying as to how I was saying it. And I accommodated them because before I went there, I was chaplain and teacher of social science at Alabama State A&M College. And they didn't require any real preaching there. And so when I found this church just like they were, I adjusted myself to them. There was a woman, Mrs. Eggister, I told this in the seminar the other day. Mrs. Eggister had taught uh, English for 45 years in the public school. Her, her grammar was impeccable. For six weeks, she, she uh, gave me every Sunday a list of the mistakes that I made. <laughs> she was as stiff as a poker. Beautiful woman, beautiful woman. She sat on the end of the choir on the front row. <laughs> and one morning, one morning, I had a great experience because I had pushed Della's push wagon and she was a prostitute and uh, those intellectuals found out that I had pushed a prostitute's wagon. And the town was in an uproar. And I told them, I said, now you know this woman is 78 years old, so I couldn't have been after her. <laughs> I said, as a matter of fact, she must be retired by now. But that Sunday morning, the church, nobody had ever been in the balcony, but that church was packed, balcony and all, all because I had pushed Della's push yeah, yeah. All right, all right. And while they were taking the penny offering, the big doors in the, in the front street, and in stepped Della. <laughs> she had on a dress, I bet she hadn't been to church in 50 years, she had on a dress. Covered it from Noah's Ark. <laughs> was in the in the front street, and in stepped Della. <laughs> she had on a dress. I bet she hadn't been to church in 
50 years, she had no dress that looked like she discovered it from Noah's Ark. <laughs> She couldn't find the seat. I said, Brother Hartsfield, give Sister Della a seat back there. He reluctantly got up and gave her a seat. And she scrowled down in that seat, scared to death. I had prepared my little essay. That fr I got through that Friday, and that Friday I pushed the wagon. But as I was passing the house next door, a Pharisee member was standing out and said, a Reverend King, we are so embarrassed. I said, about what? We heard, I don't know how it got over town that quickly, we heard that you pushed Dallas push wagon. I said, yes, for what? He said, nobody, nobody uh, associates with old Della. Della is a prostitute. Listen, 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 listen. I was not righteously indignant. I was mad. That even decent people, if they had no religion, wouldn't want anybody to mistreat a person. I went on in my house and I said, Lord, if you gave me this message, thank you, but it won't do. And I found, I found the tech, woman where I found accused. Yes, and that day, Dr. Clark, I used my will power. Yes, God had been trying to get to me all the time. Use your will. Yes. Step over these snobs. Use your will. Preach the gospel. And I preached, woman, where art thine accuser? And when I extended the open door of the church, 17 people came down. They hadn't been getting that much, that many people in revival, and among them was Della. I had Della to say a word. Della said, I was baptized in this church when I was nine years old, and those people didn't know it. And among that 17 was Mrs. Eggleston, the, the, the English teacher, her brother-in-law. He was 60 years old, he operated the pharmacist, and had never been a Christian. And when he came down, she was so moved that she looked at Cora Bradshaw and said properly, Cora, how do you shout? <laughs> she said, I don't know how to shout. Cora said, just shout, woman. And Sister Hawkins, who all on the other end, said, you can't teach a rooster how to crow. He just crows because it's in him to crow. <laughs> and the people, the people, the people, I'll never forget that in my life, the people were shouting all over that stiff church. People were shouting all over that stiff church. And that woman was the happiest woman in town. She never missed a Boy Scout meeting. She never missed a Girl Scout meeting. She never missed a choir rehearsal. She never She wasn't in any, any of them, but she never missed anything. And when she died, we, have, we had to have the police escort to conduct the traffic because she was such and instrumentality in the life of that church and the first revival that we had, Della and I brought in 92 candidates for baptism. 
It's because if I let my will break a loose for Jesus Christ. The emotions, the intellect, the will. And we must follow Jesus in this respect. Yeah. Jesus had done everything, but uh, he, he did not want to use his will. Yeah, yeah. He had the sins of the world upon him. Talk, sir. Yes, sir. But when he had to drink this cup, that meant he, he would take the sins of the world within. And he recoiled. He said, Father, Father, if it is not we, I, I'm, I, I can't do it I don't have the will. Remove it. Remove it. The serpent has spewed his poisonous venom in this cup so that everybody who drank from it would die. And God sent Jesus Christ to clean it up. And the only way you can clean it up, you got to drink from it. You got to drink from it. Jesus said, Father, if it is thy will, move. 